So good morning, family. How we doing? Yeah. Um, it is true, actually. Apparently, if you use Facebook, you know this already, that Jim is actually fishing. He's caught some big fellers. I don't know anything about You call fish fellers? Is that okay? I don't know. He's got something. Uh, so I am humbled and honored. This is uh, great for me. I've been in this part of this church for 11 years, so it's, I'm grateful to have this opportunity to, to give the message this morning. Um, we have a lot of things going on, and so I'm just going to jump right in if that's all right with you all, okay? So this message today is, is part testimony, and it's part preaching, and it's, it's part call to action. And so in a bit, I'm going to ask you to write something down. So grab a pen, paper, whatever, your phone, doesn't matter. Have something available, because at some point, you'll want it. I need to start by telling you all that I believe the words in this book are true. Not because somebody told me that I should, but because I have encountered Jesus many times, and the words in this book have transformed my life. And so the posture, the position that I come from today is deep personal conviction. I love the Lord, and because I love the Lord, I can love you. As you heard, I am the stewardship elder, and I gotta tell you that that word stewardship, uh, it's, it's been hijacked a bit, really. I mean, when we think about it, generally in human context, there's not much there, but in the Christian context, we think about financial giving. And it, it does mean that to a degree, but it means so much more than that. In fact, in Scripture, Paul uses the word mostly to refer to his mission of bringing the gospel to the world. And examples are Ephesians 3, 2, and Colossians 1, 25. 1 Corinthians 4, 1, I'll read. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. See, stewardship is about way more than just money. It is about saying yes to God. It is about going where he asked me to go and doing what he asked me to do. And so that's my question for you this morning. Do you want to say yes to God? Take a look at this picture. Not me, not the picture. <laughs> Anybody know what that is? Speak it. What is it? It's the Grand Canyon, right? It's the Grand, Grand Canyon. It is a magnificent place. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend it. My wife and I went for our anniversary this summer. And it is hard to be there and not, like, fully say, who created all this beauty? I mean, God's beauty is just on display magnificently at the Grand Canyon. And then there's this crazy thing happening. There's this trail that goes all the way down. And crazy people walk down that trail. <laughs> it's like, Whose idea was that? I have no idea. <laughs> so my wife and I are there, and it's the first day, and I don't want to go down there. But at the same time, that plateau, that spot way out there, it's calling me. Like, it's just calling me. And, and so we debate, and we talk, and we meet some people, and they encourage me. And my, my wife could run down and back, so she ain't the issue. This is the, I'm the issue. So we decide we're going to do it. We're going to go down. Next morning, we get up bright and early, 7 a.m., we're on the trail, and we begin to walk down. And it is just awesome. It just gets awesomer. Is that a word, awesomer? It gets awesomer and awesomer and awesomer. And then the most amazing thing happens. And I'll have to tell you that amazing thing later. Right now, I'm going to tell you part two of the story that Jim started last week. Jim has us in the book of Acts, chapter 10, right around verse 23. Last week, he started the encounter between Cornelius and Peter. Okay, so I'm going to refresh our memory here. Cornelius is a Roman captain, and he had a visit from an angel, and that angel told him to go find a man named Simon called Peter that's in Joppa. And right after that, over in Joppa, Peter has a vision of sheets full of animals, and he heard the voice of Jesus. 
And he was told by the Holy Spirit that three men were in the house looking for him. And so Peter goes downstairs. He tells the guy, the guys, hey, I'm the one that you're looking for, invites him in. The next day, they start the two-day journey back to Caesarea, where Cornelius is. And Cornelius is ready for them, right? He's ready. Not only is he waiting expectantly, but he invited his friends and family to his home, and they are waiting as well. So as I've read this and thought about it, I can almost see it in my mind. It's almost like a scene, right? All these things are happening. I can... So today, we're actually going to do a little acting. And you guys get to be part of the cast. How's that sound? You don't have to come up. You don't. But you are the friends and family of Cornelius. That's your role, okay? You have been invited to his house. You've been told about this vision from an angel. You're waiting for this guy who's named Simon, who's called Peter, that's coming all the way from Joppa, right? That's, that's who you are. So let's be honest. You're not all in the same camp, actually. Some of you, friends and family, you don't believe for a millisecond that Peter is actually going to show up. You have no confidence in this. But everybody is here, so you thought you should be too. And for some of you, you hope that Peter is coming. You hope he is, but you're not convinced. And for some of you, you know Peter is coming, and you can't wait to meet him. Scene 2, Acts 10, 23 through 43. The next day, Peter rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and he called together his relatives and close friends. And when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And he talked with him. He went in and found many persons gathered, and he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then, why you sent for me? And Cornelius said, Well, four days ago, I was in my house praying. It was about the ninth hour. And behold, a a man stood before me in bright clothing. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. Your alms have been remembered before God. So send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, called Peter. He is lodging in a house of a Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you've been kind enough to come. So now therefore, we're all here in the presence of God, eager to hear what you have been commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we were witnesses of all that he had both, <clears throat> and we were witnesses of all that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Let's pray. 
Lord, you have intentionally given us this story. You have made it part of your word for a reason. And we are grateful. So my prayer now, Father, is that through me or despite me, you speak to our hearts. You make your word come alive. You help us experience your presence and know you and transform our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. There is so much in this text. And I am not a theologian, so I'm not going to try to be. What I am going to do is just share with you what God has put on my heart. Let's start with Cornelius, okay? Try to imagine being him, a well-respected Roman captain. You are elite. You are upper class. Successful. Significant in the eyes of many. And then you get a visit from an angel. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. Joppa is way on the other side of the tracks. And not only do you go get a soldier and a servant and send them to tell them about this angel and send them to go find this guy, Peter, but you tell your friends and family and you invite them over your house. Can you imagine the barriers that Cornelius must have been up against? What was on the line for him? The risk of being a fool? Maybe his job? And if Peter does show up, if Peter does come, then Cornelius' life surely will be changed forever. And to what? He has no idea. Now what about Peter? After showing up at Cornelius' house, he walks inside and sees all these people. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone from another nation. He's Jewish. And for many generations, he's been taught never to hang out with those people that are different than him. His culture, his family, everything has created this. And now he's standing in the home of a Roman captain with all of those people. Can you imagine what Peter was up against? What was on the line for him? What did he have to surrender to do what God asked him to do? Risk of being a fool? Maybe being an outcast from his friends and family? And what happens when he does show up and he meets this guy Cornelius? Surely his life changes forever. And to what? He has no idea. Cornelius and Peter both said yes to God. But did they have to? I mean, did they have a choice to say yes to God or not? Of course they did. They're human. Jim made it clear to us last week that God creates opportunities for us. He calls them divine appointments. And God puts these people at our gate. He did it 2,000 years ago, and he's doing it now. But do we always say yes to God? I know that I don't. I don't always say yes to God. So why not? Our own significance often stands in the way. What we think about ourselves, our status, our job, our role as husband and wife, mother, child, our bank accounts, where we live, our traditions, our preferences, our fears, our love of comfort, our love of leisure, and even the good that we do for other people. The construct in our minds that defines us that's significance. 
And often this competing voice in our heads is what stops us from hearing the voice of the Lord and saying yes to him. Because, see, if we say yes to God, then what will it cost us? Cornelius was a Roman captain. He had title. He had status. He had power. He had position. And he risked all of that by telling his friends and families about this vision of an angel that came to him and calling them in to be part of this process. He risked being a fool. And Peter, Peter, he risked it too, being an outcast from his community. Everyone thought highly of him, and going to see this Roman guy could mess all that up. If I say yes to God, what will it cost me? So let's make this personal. I'll go first. We just moved to an older home a few months ago, and we need to do some remodeling. And so we do, and our budget's tight, and I'm cheap, so we do everything we possibly can on our own. And there's an awesome company that's offered to help us, and one of, those thing, one of the things that they've offered to do is, hey, Adrian, if you help do the install of these cabinets, which I've never done, then this will co- help cost quite a bit. And so they hooked me up with one of their leaders named Dan. So Dan comes over, we plan this whole thing out, we, and he orders this stuff, and a few weeks later comes in, and now he's in my house, and Dan and I are beginning to spend time together. And I'm beginning to hear it. I'm beginning to hear that Dan is lost. And so here I am. I have a kitchen to build. I have a schedule to keep. This is what I want to accomplish. And I am getting tugged on. I know that here is this man who is beginning to reach out to me, and he needs to know the truth about God. He needs to know where his his significance comes from, his purpose in life. He needs to know that. But if I just go there, he could say, forget you, man, I'm out. He could be offended. He could not want anything to do with me. There's all kinds of stuff. And we might miss my schedule, right? (laughs) But I know. So one night we go there. It's nearly 10 o'clock. And we get to it. That it's the Lord. Nothing else that can fill us. That night, Dan left my house and went to his boss's house, John. And John led him to Jesus. He surrendered his life. And Dan has been coming to Colonial with us ever since. My schedule, my kitchen, a man's eternity. It's a picture of my family. Nope, not me again. Yep, there it is. Our family has changed quite a bit over the last few years. Four or five years ago, God called us to adopt through foster care. And we started that journey, and we've had different children in our home. Two years ago, Jacob, Jalen, and Isaac came to live with us. And this summer, that picture is the day that they became Lewis's. This journey in foster care and and adoption It's brutal. I mean, you think you're in control of your life? Mm Mm-mm. My capacity to love challenged. My willingness to love someone and maybe have to let them go challenged. But God given me the opportunity to love these boys to change a legacy, maybe eternity. This next picture, back to our story, Grand Canyon. We're walking down this beautiful big mountain and the most amazing thing happens. I'm engaging the Lord and I'm just loving it and soaking it in and I get this nudge really clearly, I'm supposed to leave something behind 
at the bottom. So we get down to the bottom. And I'm overlooking the Colorado River. It's gorgeous, and God's majesty is everywhere. And it hits me. I'm supposed to leave behind my significance. And not just anything, but the most challenging thing in my marriage. See, I hold out, I hold out this thing that my wife is supposed to think that I'm awesome all the time, and she's supposed to be thrilled with her life all the time. I hold that up here, and when that's not happening, it jacks up my significance. That is horrible for her. And how, how limiting is that of what God is doing here? When I hold this up as my significance, instead of just following the Lord and just loving her, this is what's on the line. And I have to confess Man, I wish it was easy to lay that down because I know God has so much more for us if I can do that. But it is a battle that is willing to, that's worth fighting. In all these examples, the question is the same. What do I care about more? Saying yes to God or my dreams, my security, my status, my time, my kitchen being remodeled on my schedule? What do I really care about more? And all this points to the one main issue, my self-made significance. So here we go. It's your turn. What makes you significant? When you read God's word and you get clear instruction on what you should be doing with your life, or when you sense him nudging you to do something, or when you hear something and you know that that's the Lord, what do you grasp for? What do you fear losing? Father, I want to invite the Holy Spirit into this moment. I'm asking you, Lord, to do what only you can do. You are the one that reveals the depths of our hearts. And in this moment, Father, I'm asking you to show us. Show us the things that we hold on to. What we place our significance in. Do it in the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Anything come to you? Anything come to you? If something came to you, raise your hand. Write it down. Maybe you've read God's word about loving your neighbor as yourself, and you, you just don't have a heart for people. Why? Why? Maybe you've read God's word in Matthew 6 about not storing up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. But you have decided that you need X amount of money to live or a certain amount of money in your retirement. Jim shared with us that this is pledge season. Use this opportunity to not say what you need, but to ask the Lord sincerely, Lord, what would you have me do? What would you have me commit to? How would you have me give my life away? including my resources. Maybe you've been hurt by someone and you have bitterness, unforgiveness towards them. You know God's word. If you don't forgive others, then how can I forgive you? Take that to the Lord. Don't let that unforgiveness define you. That hurt. And maybe you carry shame.
for things you've done, things you're doing, maybe you carry around shame. You hold on to that shame like a shield. It limits you. It limits what God created you to be. That, too, is defining your own significance. Give it to him. He will take it. Do you want to say yes to God is the question. Family, hear me. When we do say yes to the Lord, amazing things happen. Amazing. Back in our text, Cornelius, he surrenders his significance and he invites his friends and family over to to wait while this guy Peter shows up. And Peter comes, even though it's against everything that's inside of him. And what happens... What happens when he does, when they do this? The gospel is shared. It's shared. Scripture says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that God did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death on a cross. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Let that soak in for just a minute. Jesus, the Son of God, let let people hang him from a tree. He let people kill him. Take his life. He stepped down from heaven to be a human. Philippians 2.7 says, Jesus emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. No one, people, listen to me, no one, no one has laid down more to follow God than Jesus No one has surrendered more than Jesus. No one. And for what? Mm. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. What's my status? I am forgiven. What makes me truly powerful? The Holy Spirit. What gives me real security? It's the promises of God. And what makes me significant? It's Jesus. For those of you who are already giving your lives to Jesus, I am inviting you to lay down whatever he's brought to your mind. We are about to take the Lord's Supper in a few minutes. Really, really remember and celebrate who he is and lay down what he's asked you to lay down. And for some of you, you haven't yet taken a knee. You haven't yet surrendered whatever it is that's stopping you from letting Jesus in. If you are ready to receive the gift of forgiveness, if you are ready, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is the one who is there to give you that forgiveness, he is the son of God, then I am going to invite you to pray with me today this morning to pray with me, to repent, to let him in, and to come and take the Lord's Supper for the first time as a new creation. Let's pray. Lord, there are people here who are just what I just said. 
They haven't let you in, Jesus. I ask you, Lord, for forgiveness of sins, of my sins, to forgive their sins. I agree with you, Lord, that you are, in fact, the Savior of the world, Jesus. And I repent, and I welcome the Holy Spirit into my life to transform me so the old me can die and the new me can begin. And Father, there are some here who have been holding on to things really tightly. Their self-made significance is so limiting of what is possible with your power and your name and all that you've put in front of us, Lord. And so I'm asking you to meet them where they are and help us to lay down, lay down this false sense of significance so that we can be more of what you created us to be and live a life of adventure beyond what we can imagine. To take us places, Lord, that only you can take us. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father forever. Amen.